Hi, Nikita. Hey, Bob. How are you doing? Um, I'm processing Putin's last uh, speech from last night, uh, which is, it's, take, it's taking time. Yeah, now well, that, the news feeds. that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Let yeah. me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. Uh, and you are Nikita Petrov. You're a Russian. You're, you, you live in St. Petersburg. Is that where you are now? Yes, I am. Yeah. And uh, you you do some work for me, uh, but uh, that's not really the reason you're here. I just wanted to get uh, a Russian's reaction to what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, the And you're interesting to me because I don't want to say you're just a regular Russian. There's, you're, you're in many ways a highly irregular person, Nikita, but... You're not some kind of commentator. I, I don't even think of you as an as you're not like some kind of politics junkie. You you no. pay attention to the news, but your you know your interests are more in areas like art and culture. You're probably um, well at the same time. I don't want to say you're kind of a typical Russia Russian. There are different subcultures in Russia, just as there are in other countries. Uh but anyway, I thought it would be interesting to, to hear how you're processing this. Uh, let me let me just tell people what's happened. At the moment we're recording this, uh, Russia has recognized the two breakaway republics in the Donbass region of Ukraine. Putin has, I think the troops have crossed the border. He sent troops in. And of course, uh, by recognizing them, that means that in his view, this isn't technically an invasion, but it is a violation of international law, for the record, in my view. I suspect uh, he's going to, there's going to be fighting and he's going to uh, push the separatist held parts of these two republics uh, all the way to the borders of the republics. Right now, the separatists only, only control about a third of the total area. That's my guess. We don't know. I'd be shocked if there's not fighting. I mean, I uh, so in other words, I think I think you know we are now going to have some version of the war that people have dreaded. And Putin last night gave this speech, which I actually haven't read. It's being depicted in the West as him being crazy and unhinged. On the other hand, our coverage tend, tends to you know kind of have that coloration to it when we're talking about Putin. He was already being depicted as crazy and unhinged, and I don't actually think he had done that many things that required that interpretation, but. With that as as background, um, well, before you you talk about the speech, quickly, do you want to try to sit your situate yourself in kind of Russian society? I mean, in other words, what kind of people do you hang out with? Uh, you know, you're not. I, it's safe to say you're not a hardcore uh, Putin supporter. Uh, in fact, I think you've been at demonstrations at some point in your life that would suggest otherwise. Um, but, a long but, time ago, a long time ago. Long before time it was, ago. Before, before it, it became extremism. Before extremism, that became extremism, you yeah. You, you, you were, yeah. Um, so, and that, that's kind of, that's one thing that actually has kind of happened. He, it, it's considered riskier now. The uh, last... To, yeah. I, I mean, pick your threshold, pick your date. Uh, we might use Navalny's return to Russia was another return to more um, reaction. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's, it's riskier. There are more cases, more people are in jail, uh, more people have left the country. Um, right now, we're, I mean... We've been having these conversations every, I don't know, a year or so. You and I catch up on the state of affairs in Russia, and it's getting darker uh, mm -hmm. right now. I mean, the first of these we talked, there was an oppositional movement. There's not an oppositional movement anymore. Uh, everybody who is a kind of an oppositional figure is either jailed or dead or outside the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, And the last... Big protests that happened were when Navalny came back uh, and was jailed, and um, some people are, uh, you know, in jail after those protests, and mm -hmm. um, and then others are afraid to. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen with this 
somebody you know filed a registered a rally like an anti-war rally but the people who filed it are not uh i, I don't know we'll see I, I i doubt a lot of people will show up just because it's become so risky mm-hmm. okay so you um so what did you listen to the speech i did i did twice uh, I, I listened yesterday when he was giving the speech on uh, sped up because I started listening when he was already have had been talking for 20 or 30 minutes and my girlfriend was struggling with that being in the background. So I just sped it up. And then today I listened to it on at normal speed. It's we it's one of the weirder is troubling. It's, um, uh, you know, by the end of it, it, that was my reaction. And then I saw that many people had the same reaction. And by the end of it, when it, 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 the last few minutes, he finally said, so we're going to recognize the breakaway republics. Uh, I almost felt like few because for a minute, it sounded like he's going to end with, we're not going to recognize Ukraine as a country anymore. His, mm-hmm. He gave this long view of history, his version of the history of the 20th century. And it sounded like, you know, to begin with, uh, Ukraine as we know it now, the borders that it has is a consequence of a series of errors on the part of the Soviet leadership. Uh, he said that Ukraine could be called, like it should have in the title a reference to Lenin because he's the architect. He's the reason they have Donbass to begin mm-hmm. with. And then Stalin uh, gave them some German and Polish territory, and then Khrushchev gave them Crimea. And I think from the you know context of the speech, it sounded like he treats the Soviet leaders as leaders of Russia. Like you know, Lenin was an internationalist. Mm. The, the Bolsheviks wanted a war, a world revolution. They were not. Uh, the original idea was not to take over the Russian Empire, put a different flag on top of it, and uh, do Russian Empire 2.0, but in Putin's view, it sounded like Soviet leaders are Russian leaders. And so whatever Ukraine has, this is what Russian leaders gave them. Um, that's, you know, to begin with. And then... So in other words, kind of Russian hour. leaders giveth and Russian leaders can taketh away? I mean... <sighs> well, he he said one line that was disturbing. He said, uh, so credited Lenin with designing Ukraine. And then he said, now they're uh, toppling Lenin's statues and they're calling it decommunization. Well, if you want decommunization, we can show you what that is. You know, if you, if you want to go that way, go all the way. He means who is toppling the statues? Oh, in Ukraine, there, there's been this process the of- The Ukrainian nationalists being, are toppling uh, statues of- Russian. I wouldn't say nationalists. Uh, it, I, it's, I mean, that's what yeah. happens in post-Soviet republics. First, you have yeah. a lot of Lenin statues, and then you start to get rid of them. But I mean, the people who identify, the people in Ukraine who identify closely with Russia, we might call them the ethnic Russians or the natively Russian-speaking Ukrainians or whatever. They're probably not the ones toppling the statues, mainly. Um, the statues aren't being toppled in the Donbass, probably, or at least not not in the parts held by. I separate. wonder. I don't. I don't know how mm. many Lenin statues are left in Ukraine, but okay. it's been a. I, I, I'm pretty sure that, you know, at least okay. some Lenin statues in the east were taken down as well. Okay, so, you know, w- one thing I wondered. You know, people said, "Well, he's saying Ukraine isn't real, so he's clearly going to tear the whole thing apart," or occupy the whole thing or something. That's some reaction. I was wondering whether um, actually this is mainly about justifying just the occupation of the Donbass and again, probably military action, at least to the extent of the borders of these two republic, republics, which could get a lot of people killed, of course, but it's different from occupying Kiev. And so, so what you're saying is that Given how dramatically he'd set it up and given how thoroughly he had questioned the very uh, authentic coherence of Ukraine, you were almost relieved when at the end he said, I'm, ju- I'm just recognizing these two republics. Well, because they 
took an hour for him to get to the point, right? Mm-hmm. He, he gave this whole lecture on the history of the 20th century where, you know, he, he said what I uh, just tried to relay about the kind of foundations of Ukraine. And he says that Ukraine now is a puppet regime. Uh, it's really the United States that are calling the shots to the extent that like uh, military orders are taken from NATO commanders. You know, this is just completely, it's not a, its own state. Um, and so, you know, after 55 minutes of that, uh, it, you know, it sounded scary. And then at the end when he said it, it did sound, I mean, maybe that's the, uh, you know, the theatrics of it. Maybe he wanted to ramp it mm-hmm. up at first and then calm it down a little bit uh, or to keep you on the edge of your seat. And, uh, you know, I'm still not sure. I, like you say, is occupation of uh, Kiev a, a possibility? Two weeks ago, I would say, this is crazy, but now I don't know. I was just kind of shocked by the speech, and uh, now I'm not sure what. I mean, I still think it's highly, highly unlikely. It would be disastrous. It doesn't make any sense to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know. He's playing a weird, uh, risky game. There is uh, one kind of theme in recent coverage of Russia. Here has been, you know. I mean, there's, there have always been people who depicted him as crazy or irrational in ways I thought just didn't make sense. I mean, uh, he's, he's always seemed to me a person who took calculated risks, but never overplayed his hand in a fundamental way. Uh, you, you know, it, it, um, and uh, is fundamentally a rational, self-interested politician. Um, but lately, there's been this theme that, well, maybe during COVID, he's gotten crazier or something. Is that is this something that Russians are? Well, is it something they were saying? First of all, before the speech, have they have they has this been a thing in Russia? He's getting weirder. I mean, the reality has been getting weirder, right? With COVID, with I mean, with Putin, like the the most obvious, superficial, I suppose, thing, but. But still, uh, it leaves a mark. Is with the with the danger of COVID. He's been doing these like he's not meeting people face to face. So when Macron showed up, I mean, this is so. Putin was talking to Macron. Macron uh, came to Russia. Uh, I first saw the, the picture, and it, many people have made fun of it. There's this incredibly long Big table, table, right? And they're sitting on the opposite sides of it. That seemed bizarre. Then I saw the headline uh, in the news explaining the long table, and it was, uh, we can't afford uh, for a foreign government to have our president's DNA. And what? we can't afford for a foreign government to have access to the president's wait, DNA. Wait, who, who said that? The government didn't say that, did they? So I, I saw the headline. I thought... Putin is losing his fucking marbles. Then I clicked on the article. Turns out that was the French side explaining why they were sitting at this table. So apparently Macron <laughs> was offered to either get the PCR test, uh, oh. you know, the no swab, mm-hmm. swab um, or to sit at the long table. And they declined the test because Russians might steal Macron's DNA and yeah. who knows what they're going to do with that. So reality has been getting weird. Like, it, you know, the the idea of Russia's absurd or Russian authority said something weird. I'm used to that. Um, but in this case, you know, my uh, expectations were, you know, I was surprised to see that it's not our side. Mm-hmm. But so, yeah, his, th- these long distances, there are many shots of different, like his, uh, you know, it was Christmas. He's in the temple alone. Uh, he went to pay respects to the... Uh, people who died in the Second World War, he's alone on the, at the graveyard. Uh, he's doing this. The yesterday's events, first there was this uh, weird also kind of theatrical thing where uh, the members of the government one by one ca- were asking him to recognize the republics. He, he asked them to provide their opinion. He said, 
I, you all know, I haven't talked to you about this before. Right. Um, I want your blunt opinion. What do you think? And so then one by one, they had to do this thing. One of them got confused as to what he has to say. And it was- I saw that. Um, and so all of that happened also like- But, but, but go, I mean, stable. go ahead and tell that story. It's kind of funny. The one guy maybe was a few weeks ahead in the playbook when he, when he said, yes, I'm in favor of Russia absorbing the two republics. And, and, and Putin said, no, 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 we're not talking about that. We're talking about he, yeah, just recognizing was, their independence. There, there was this whole back and forth. He starts saying, um, at first he starts saying, uh, I agree that maybe we should give the West one last chance for you know diplomacy to, uh, and, and Putin's like, wait, so you're saying we should start the negotiation process. And then the guy, you, you see the fear in his eyes and he's like, well, I mean, uh, I mean, yeah, we should, I, I would support the, no, the motion. And Putin says, you would or you are supporting the motion? He's like, I, I am. So then say it. Okay, yes, I am saying I, I am supporting the motion to accept the Donetsk and the Luhansk People's Republic into Russia. And Putin says, that's not what we're talking about, though. We're talking about their independence. Not So, you know, the, 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 there was this whole parade of these people saying, please do. And then at the end, he says, uh, I heard you. I'm going to go think about it. And then I'll deliver the decision by the end of today. Do you, do you think most Russians, like, they watch this and they don't realize it's totally choreographed and that Putin told, basically told them, this is what you say, and then I'm going to pretend I'm going to think about it? You know, it could be that he didn't tell them that. It huh. could be that it was their job to understand that's what they need to say. I mean, yeah. this is not very difficult to guess right. what's expected. It could be one um, one comment that I saw was that uh, the people in the room, the people who were given these, uh, you know, asking him to recognize the Republic, they're not really on the same team. They're, each of them is on the same team with Putin. And that's what they need to establish in that uh in that meeting. They need to show loyalty. They need to say, I, I will support you. Uh, but they themselves aren't necessarily friends. And so it could be his way of, you know, psychologically dominating his own government, mm -hmm. you know, to, to make them, you know, play this out, to, to do this ritual. This was some uh, kind of national security council or something, or uh, uh, but is, these were people uh, from different regions. No, this is this is the federal it's, government, it's different the cabinet branches. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, do you have a? Well, first of all, let me ask you: since the speech, have you kind of checked in with your friends online? I mean, let's let's talk for starters about just your milieu, which of course is not representative of Russia at large, but it's representative of of something. You're relatively cosmopolitan, uh, younger than the average Russian, well-educated. Uh, have you have you gotten a sense for how your your crowd is processing this? Yeah, all of the reactions that I've seen are people are alarmed and confused and uh, are worried about the future. Worried about what he's going to do in Ukraine, mainly, or just or just like. Uh, we're starting I mean, to worry about his stability or? The speech was Cold War rhetoric that I don't think we've seen since the collapse of the Soviet Union. He's saying that Ukraine is not a real state. It's a puppet state controlled by the Americans. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Americans have been, uh, you know, expanding that NATO eastwards. Uh, breaking all their promises. Ukraine, so Zelensky said something the other day. He was um, complaining about the West, that he's not getting enough support from the mm -hmm. West. Uh, you know, they're, uh, you know, doing this lip service, but this, not This is the it president with, of Ukraine, of course. Yeah. That's right. Go ahead. And, and uh, in, in those remarks, he said, listen, we uh, gave up the nuclear weapons in 1994 with the understanding that our borders are going to be respected. This was, you know, the exchange. If you're, you guys, the West, uh, are not going to 
back us up in this crisis uh, and not just talk about it, but actually help us maintain the integrity of the uh, territory, we might give up that promise. So Zelensky is saying maybe Ukraine is going to develop its own nuclear program. Now, in Putin's, the, the, the worldview that he outlined in the speech yesterday, Ukraine is not its own state. It's an arm of the United States. So if they're saying we're going to have nuclear weapons, that's the United States saying there are going to be nuclear weapons at Russia's border. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't heard that from him, that, you know, we're, we're now talking about a nuclear war, you know, uh, America versus Russia with Ukraine playing, um, you know, a, a kind of subservient role uh, on, the, on behalf of the USA. Um, and then what he does, we don't know. So again, first, as of now, they've, they said they recognize the breakaway republics. There have been follow-ups. Which borders do you mean? The borders that they currently are in or the borders of the regions, which they only control, you know, a third of. Mm -hmm. And there have, hasn't been a clear answer yet. Uh, the latest that I saw just an hour ago, uh, the foreign ministry said, this is not a question that is solved in a day. Yeah. So you're going to have to watch. So if they, if, if it's the entire region, then I don't see how you do that without fighting. If there's fighting, then this is Russians and Ukrainians killing each other. This is Russian army officially engaged mm -hmm. in uh, warfare with Ukrainian army. and by uh you know western metrics that's an invasion of ukraine and uh and all of that can happen right about now and then who knows what the next step is going to be how what reaction is going to be from the west what sanctions they impose uh what putin uh does in response to those yeah i think he may pause but if he thinks that then he's going to get the concessions he had hoped for, I think he's confused because I think the politics in the West will permit that even less than they uh, permitted it before. The the um, so you mentioned his uh, you know so so again I think there there is going to be fighting and, and I would guess he's gonna he's gonna push the borders all the way out to what are the borders of those two two provinces, right. republics, whatever. And that's a long way. And there's a, right now, I think there's a lot of Ukrainian soldiers standing in between him and him and those borders. So it, it could get pretty bad. Right. The, um, so you said he, he considers Ukraine an arm of the West. Now I know a big uh, moment for him in his psychology is the 2014 deposing of a, the president of Ukraine who was pretty pro-Russian uh, and and I know a big thing for Putin is the fact that there was American involvement in that. I mean, kind of famously, there's a tape. The Russians apparently taped a co phone conversation unbeknownst to the participants. Victoria Nuland, a U.S. State Department official mm -hmm. and the amba U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, uh, where they were talking before the president was deposed about who should succeed him. Uh -huh. And they said, well, it shouldn't be this guy because he's like this. It should, uh, it should be this guy. Uh, and, and this guy did indeed become not president, but prime minister. And that's what they were talking about. It, it, it made him for a time, I think, the, in effect, the head of the government. And uh, so it, it seemed as if, I mean, in addition, you know, Victoria Newland was kind of in a showy way, walking around the Maidan, passing cookies out to the protesters, the anti-president protesters, before it turned violent. And there's now, uh, you know, the Western story is that what happened is that the president's uh, troops fired on the protesters. The other side of the story is there were provocateurs, false flags, something or other, whatever. But I'm, I'm sure that's the version that Putin buys. Um, so, so there really was Western involvement in this. And the, sure. if you listen to that phone conversation, I'll tell you, it just sounds like it sounds like uh, two American officials are basically they think they can call the shots. They really it's clear they think they can decide who is going to run the government after this president leaves. And then he did leave for fear of his life. Armed opponents roaming the streets. He fled. So from Russia's point of view, it looks like an American sponsored 
coup. That's whatever the truth is. That's not to me a surprising interpretation. It's not surprising that Putin would have that interpretation, uh, given given the the evidence. I, I'm wondering, did that get a ton of attention in Russia, as you recall? That, that was a while ago now, eight years ago now. You would have been, may, I don't know, maybe just out of college or something. But um, specifically, as an old conversation, I don't remember that bit. But the I th- that's not the only thing you can point to. I mean, John McCain was on stage at the Maidan um, and uh, it was a turn to, uh, you know, the US and, and the EU and uh, the the new government was subsidized by the West. My mother, she's Ukrainian, half Ukrainian. She's from Ukraine. Mm. She watches a lot of Ukrainian TV, which I think is, I, I keep telling her, don't watch either Russian or Ukrainian TV. Either one of those is not good for you, but she does. And uh, uh, she kept, you know, she reports to me what what uh, it's like on Ukrainian TV. And she said that for a while it was uh, really, like that, that was the uh, new, not even just the government, just like that, of that movement's kind of attitude that we are trying to integrate with the West we're going to get the money. We're going to do what they say we need to do to get the money. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, the the people on that side would say this is not, uh, you know, th- this is a civilizational choice. Ukraine wants to be integrated with the West. And in order to do that, they need to make these agreements and, uh, yeah, follow um, something that might sound like orders at times. You know, try to find its way, try to establish sovereignty, but uh, the you know issue at hand is to get into EU, to get into NATO, and you know compromises need to be made or uh, you know conditions. The West might have conditions that you need to follow. Uh, but yeah, there's clearly there's a turn to the West, and uh, then which is not supported by all Ukrainians, but a lot of. Uh, a lot of them, especially in Western Ukraine. Yeah, I actually don't know. You know, I haven't been in Ukraine in a long time. I don't know how it is now. I'm sure, you know, eight years of war has changed something. That There's probably been, you know, migration and, and people changing their minds. And I don't know uh, how the edges in the East have changed, uh, if they changed a lot. Uh, but yeah, there is the traditional kind of narrative is the East is pro-Russian, the West is pro-West. And um, and I don't know how it's been changing, what the dynamics of it is now. So, so your mother had one Russian parent, one ethnically Russian parent and one ethnically Ukrainian parent? That's right. And she was born in a Ukrainian village. In what part of Ukraine, East or West? Was it main, more of a Russian-oriented? Actually, I, 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 I'm actually not sure. I think it was in the West. I think it was like the original. I mean, she traveled uh, around a lot, and she lived in Kazakhstan and uh, was a teenager. But I see. Uh, originally, she's from a Ukrainian village. And, and what is her view of this whole thing? Have you talked to her since? You haven't talked to her since the speech, probably. But uh, I have exchanged a few messages. I, I mean, it's all. It's like you know, a, a train wreck, a runaway. You, you, you're watching it, and you're just hoping for the best. But uh, I don't know how good it's going to be, and she's. She's in the same. She said she was very concerned after she saw the speech. She said that her comparison was this is Stalin in his late stages where he's completely paranoid. Everybody's against him. And uh, he's, uh, you know, encircled by the enemies. He sees enemy everywhere, enemies everywhere. And her assessment was the man's losing his marbles. Huh. I don't know if that's the case. I don't know if uh, it's new. I don't know how much of what he says he truly believes and how much of it is rhetoric. Um, you know, it's hard to say. It kind of sounds like he, the world, the worldview that he outlined kind of sounds like he actually thinks that, uh, I don't know if that's new. Uh, maybe he's just bolder in, uh, saying it. And your um, and do you think your mother, because of her kind of mixed heritage has, you know, a somewhat objective view? In other words, is, is she, you don't associate her particularly with, on the one hand, staunchly pro-Russian nationalists, or on the other hand, 
uh, as being, you know, uh, some kind of secret Ukrainian, pro-Ukrainian <laughs> agitator or something, right? I mean, in other words, her view of the speech, that it's really alarming, is not coming from, uh, you, you would find it credible based on her, uh, I don't know. I don't know what even question I'm asking. Do you want to say anything in response to this? Yeah, it's not, it's, this is not about really the relationship between the Ukrainians and Russians. You know, this is politicians possibly starting a war that may, you know, go further than, than uh, you know, the original conceptions of it. Yeah. That's the fear. Nobody wants a war. I, I don't think people in Ukraine or in Russia want the war. Uh, and that's scary. And so when people start talking about nuclear weapons at the border of the country and how, uh, you know, it's like Russia versus America, uh, that's just scary. Yeah. I would, have, I, I would have thought that what he meant by that is, look, America is going to turn Ukraine into a base for nuclear missiles. And that's why we cannot uh, tolerate like Ukraine getting into NATO and blah, blah, right. blah. And that's why I have to right. act. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have necessarily taken that as some kind of threat that this could go nuclear, but maybe I didn't, I didn't see it on the other hand. I'm just well, you were saying, uh, I mean, I, I think you're right in, in the, the message of it, but uh, you know, he listed particular carriers like missile carriers yeah. that they have. And uh, this one takes four minutes to get to most yeah. of Western Russia uh, is just again yeah, we haven't we haven't heard much of that well, well, kind we'll of like really alarmist rhetoric. Yeah, well, see, we we are putting an anti missile system mm. within a hundred yards, a uh, hundred miles of the Russian border in Poland, and although technically it's a defensive weapon, and we we say it's actually it's it's for uh, you know it's for intercepting Iranian missiles. Well, fine, but it can obviously be used to intercept uh, any kind of missiles and. And although it's technically a defensive weapon, he would be right to think, well, yeah, but it can have offensive purposes. If you were going to that. attack us, yeah, well, it does. He's been it's saying true. that, yeah. If you yeah. are going to attack us, it's going to help you that you can shoot down any missiles we fire in response. Defensive weapons are offensive weapons. Now, so, I mean, I, I guess my perspective is, I mean, I mean, and, and I'm interested, I'd be interested to hear what, how conscious you've been of the whole NATO expansion issue. I mean, I remember the 1990s when we started expanding NATO and some very wise voices in the American foreign policy establishment, mm -hmm. back when I think the establishment, frankly, was wiser than it is now, were mm -hmm. saying, this is crazy. Don't, don't expand it one inch toward the east, you know, beyond eastern Germany, at least. Uh, Russia will find this threatening. George Kennan, the guy who, the architect of the containment doctrine, said, this is crazy. Uh, then again, you know, other people said that. Uh, Matlock, who who had been the, the ambassador to the Soviet Union, said that. He had been like Reagan's guy. He was not some kind of dove. He said, this is crazy. It will only lead to trouble. In 2008, Bill Burns, who is now the director of the CIA, sent a mem This was, uh, 2008 was the fateful year when George W. Bush, we had already added a bunch of countries to NATO, and George W. Bush said, we want to we wanna pledge that we will eventually let Ukraine and Georgia into NATO. And right. he kind of strong-armed the Europeans into accepting that. They didn't want to accept it. Bill Burns, who is now head of the CIA, sent a memo to Condoleezza Rice, the Secretary of State. She, he said, this is a red line for Russia. He, and he explicitly said, it's not just Putin. He said, believe me, everyone in the national security establishment, all Russian elites think Ukraine is an absolute red line. If you start, if you promise to let Ukraine into NATO, it will be a huge fucking mistake. And he even said Russia will start meddling in Eastern. It, 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 what he said is this will be fertile ground for Russia to meddle into Eastern Ukraine. So, you know, from my point of view, we've been asking for this kind of trouble. Wiser heads warned about it. And, and I'm wondering, uh, again, you're not a super politically plugged in person. You've never had aspirations, I think, to be a political journalist or to be this or to be that. You know, you're, you, but, but you as just a Russian who pays attention, have you been aware uh, over the last 10, 15 years and going Absolutely, back to your yeah. teenage, well, yeah, well, it, I mean, just, what does this all look like from your perspective? 
uh, what you're saying, basically. No, no Russian wants more NATO bases around the country, for sure. Uh, I actually haven't heard a good counter narrative. Like what Putin keeps saying is, listen, they tell us this is all defensive. This is not against you. Then I'm asking, well, who is it against then? And why is it at our borders? And they don't have a good response. Right. Is there a, a good, no. good answer no. to that? No, there's not. I mean, nobody, in other words, you can imagine someone having outlined an alternative use of NATO. Like, you know, I don't remember one. When Clinton, when Clinton launched the- Counterterrorism, I think I've heard. Yeah. As a, well, I, I'll tell you what I think uh, maybe the most common rationale was, that it was a way of consolidating uh, the gains for democracy and mm -hmm. a free market, you know, economic and political liberalism, like as these Eastern European, they seem to be moving to our model, democracy, free market. If we put them in NATO, that will kind of somehow consolidate the gain. Now, first of all, the current uh, situation in Hungary suggests you're wrong. We're all we're all we're all screaming about how illiberal Hungary is. Well, it's in NATO. Apparently, that didn't help. Uh, but the 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 other issue is, um, you know, it, it, it's just uh, let's look at the cost here. I mean, uh, it's it, it's uh, I, I you know, in terms of Russia's perception and in terms of exactly what we're seeing. And and, and what's sad is that now. Uh, you know, America having made, I think, so many missteps, including the, in effect, intervention in a, a kind of intervention, not military, but a kind of intervention in Ukrainian politics in 2014, but certainly the expansion of NATO. Now, everyone, the way Putin is behaving will allow Americans to just ignore all that, right? It's like, this has nothing to do with us. It's It's just a crazy Russian leader. Whereas, probably... If we hadn't ever expanded NATO, we'd be in an extremely different place. Uh, I mean, I do think Ukraine was going to become a delicate situation in any event. And I think uh, he he is threatened yeah, there, yeah. not just by NATO membership, but by EU affiliation. And uh, and I think there what you needed was some kind of delicate compromise where EU some kind of affiliation with the EU could have uh, happened without it coming at the expense of uh, Russia's economic relationship with Ukraine. But I, I gather that the EU was kind of s not open to that kind of compromise. Anyway, I'm just uh, I'm just venting about uh, the U.S. foreign policy establishment. Um, so I'll stop. But 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 it's interesting that you have been. This has been a real thing, the NATO expansion thing in in Russia. Everyone's kind of been aware of it. Of course, the, the yeah, the NATO expansion and the, the other part of this narrative is the uh, quote-unquote orange revolutions. This is in reference to the, or not co color revolutions. So yeah. in Ukraine, it was the orange revolution. In Georgia, forget what they called it. Um, but the narrative is these are not revolutions. These are coups. There is a, a, a methodology to stage in these, uh, you know, you stage public unrest, you take advantage of it, you install your own, uh, you know, a government that's sympathetic to you. Um, and uh, what's happening with Ukraine is very similar, I suppose, to what happened with Georgia. So there was a revolution, there was a pro-Western government installed after the revolution. There are disputed territories. Uh, the war of uh, 2008 was, uh, there was, the way I remember it, uh, it was pretty clear that Georgia did attack uh, the capital of South Ossetia. And then Russia, having previously given out passports, Russian passports, to a lot of the population of South Ossetia, right. moved in, secured uh, the region. Uh, and then, by, I mean, that was, though, a long conflict. That was like Georgia versus South Ossetia, that's a, a, an Abkhazia. Those were long-standing conflicts right. from the beginning of the uh, 90s. And um, and it was in 2008 that Russia recognized Abkhazia and South Ossetia as independent states. Mm -hmm. And now they're there. Uh, I was in Abkhazia uh, last summer, 
uh, it was a weird experience because the, the world, as far as the world is concerned, I was in Georgia. As far as my iPhone is concerned, I'm in Georgia. My, uh, you know, when I look at geolocation, the phone tells me I'm in Georgia. I was clearly not in Georgia because, uh, you know, the, it's Russian rubles, it's uh, Abkhazian flags, uh, apparently not a whole lot of Germ- uh, Georgians present because they still have, you know, their issues. Um, but it's just there. It's this region that they think they're Abkhazia, the world thinks they're Georgia, and this might be the scenario that this goes down now with Ukraine. You, Putin secures these two regions, yeah. recognizes them as independent states. They become these buffer zones. Uh, the world thinks this is Ukraine. Russia says they're independent states. Russia subsidizes them heavily. Um, and they're just there. And, pr- and probably keeps troops there. Which, which right. there are not in South Ossetia now, right? There are not Russian troops? or I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's peace. Uh, yeah. there, there's no war there. The, um, yeah, so the color revolution you referred to, now that happened before 2014 uh, when, when, when Ukraine, in effect, I guess became a, a democracy maybe and, and deposed well, an authoritarian. Were, I mean, ostensibly there were democracy. They were as much democratic as Russia at the time. And, Okay, so maybe I'm confused about that, but but the color revolution per se was before 2014. And my my question is, was it your? And so so you're saying going that far back? I don't know what year that was. Going that far back, uh, I guess the I guess that what happened with the color revolution was a pro-Russian leader was deposed, was replaced with a pro-Western leader. Maybe is it is it a widespread? It was, yeah, go ahead. It was an election uh, that. Uh, the protesters claimed was rigged. So the, you know, they, they said that the Russia pro-Russian leader won and uh, people said that the election was rigged and there was a massive protest and the protesters won and their guy came to power. And in America, the widespread perception would be they were right, it was rigged. What is the perception? Is, is the pretty widespread popular perception in Russia the opposite? That, no, this was Western meddling, it's not so clear it was rigged or what? That's pretty widespread. I don't know if that's uh, the majority opinion. Probably, I would guess it's probably the majority opinion. Uh-huh. Um, man, it was a long time ago. I was, I must have been like 17, 16. Mm-hmm. Um, when it was happening, I had the uh, the feeling that this is uh, you know beautiful, uh, popular pro democracy movement. People taking charge of their faith, et cetera, et cetera. But as mm-hmm. I said, I was sixteen, seventeen. And uh, is this is this the view of the twenty fourteen revolution in Ukraine pretty much the same in Russia, Western? Western this is engineered. different because this was not an election. It was right. not a, a disputed was a, election. Was a coup. And it view. was, yeah. uh, well, whatever word you use, a coup or a revolution, it was, there was no transfer of power, right? There was no... Uh, no democratic uh, transfer. Yeah, there was no, uh, you know, there was a president and the president fled. Uh, and, and prior to that, a whole bunch of stuff happened. And then you, you know, you start arguing about who's to blame, who, uh, you know, got the situation to that place. Um, but but it's clearly a different kind of situation. It's not that people voted and then they argued about how the votes were counted. Uh, and is the perception in Russia pretty widespread that there was some uh, illegitimate Western meddling in that? Um, yeah, it's pretty widespread. Again, it's hard to gauge whether that's a majority opinion or not. And there's also, there's clearly, again, been involvement. We know that. Then you argue about what's legitimate, what's illegitimate. Uh, and there you get stuck because people pick sides. Mm-hmm. And what about uh, your perception of the, again, there is no single Russian perception. But w- when we look at the things that have been going on in Ukraine, as Putin spins them, I mean, he's talking about a lot of persecution of ethnic Russians. I think it's true that the Ukrainian government has been reducing the role of the Russian language in some public schools. It's been closing 
Russian media, Russian language media outlets. Uh, that was that was a it it went into into effect I think pretty recently, and it was a weird like the kind of language game they played there. They the the law is it's not like against Russian language the way it's, right. it's phrased. It's that uh, media outlets that are in foreign languages that are not one of the languages of, what do they call them? Um, I forget the terms. They did. There's a different law that preceded this one where there was a list of languages of like uh, peoples who are historically the peoples of Ukraine and Russians somehow didn't make the list, the list which is pretty weird. Yeah, it is. Um, because don't, don't most either a large number of or even most Ukrainians at least speak Russian more or less, even if they're not native Russian speakers. I mean, it's a pretty common language, right? Yeah. The further west you go, the less people speak Russian fluently and yeah. some people don't speak it at all. But uh, yeah, and, and the languages are very similar and, and there are a lot of ethnic Russians in Ukraine. So th that was weird that Rus Russians didn't make that list. And then they passed the Southern Law, which said that every... Uh, you know, news uh, media outlet that is printed in a language that's not one of those traditional languages of Ukraine needs to have a Ukrainian version in its full, like it should be the exact same thing, the exact same volume of information just printed in Ukrainian. And then there's this caveat added that this this is a general rule except for English and the languages of European countries of, mm -hmm. of the European. So it's like you only left basically with Russian. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's so it's clearly an, uh, a law against yeah Russian speaking media, Russian Russian language media, um, but it's phrased in this more vague way. Um and. So, are, are, is your sense that most Russians are, are buying Putin's view that there's really serious persecution of ethnic Russians going on in Ukraine? Now, he's using the term genocide, so he must be referring to more than what we've been describing. He may just yeah. be talking about ethnic Russians who have been killed in the kind of civil war in the Donbass. I don't, I don't know what exactly he means by that. I mean, first of all, uh, do you know what he means by that? And He's talking about Donbass and he's talking about the uh, other people who died during the uh, 2014 situation. There were people who uh, were, there was a, a, a building that was burned in Odessa and people died there. Um, so yeah, he's talking about just Russians who died in the events since yeah. 2014. Uh, I mean, again, I, I need to make all these caveats. It's, it's hard to speak on behalf of like the majority of Russians. What is the general opinion? But I think the general opinion, with the caveat said, is uh, that the regime is anti-Russian, um, but it's not as dire as Putin makes. I mean, so as I said, so here's this law uh, about Russian speaking mm -hmm. media. So that's a fact. That's there. That's a sign. Um, but from that to genocide is a pretty long right. way. But but when he uh, when he talks about the persecution of ethnic Russians in Ukraine, I assume that there's some kind of substantial uh, kind of Russian nationalist contingent in Russia that is very responsive to that message. I, I mean, th there is a there is a constituency there. Probably. There's not a whole lot of political life in Russia. Like, there's, you know, it's not that there are debates between different factions. Yeah. You know, Putin has his people who, as I, you know, I described this theater of yesterday, uh, where he they all needed to say the thing without him prompting, without him telling what to say. Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as like opposition leaders, as I said, either jail or immigration or death. Uh, and there's no, you know, uh, like, it's not like you, you turn on TV. There, you, you do, do, there are people yelling at each other on TV, but it's only the people who were invited there specifically to yell uh, according to the rules that were given to them. 
So you, you don't not, have that this. itself is not entirely unlike American TV, but still <laughs> there, there is a much greater plurality uh, of views expressed, I'm sure, in American media. Um, go ahead. Were you going to say something else? So I'm just saying it's hard to gauge, like, like those Russian nationalists you're talking about. I would need to have some Russian nationalist friends to find out what they think. They're not present in the public sphere. Uh, so 10 years ago, it was different. 10 years ago, you know, there was this like uh, broadly oppositional milieu and it included nationalists, included liberals, and you can get a sense of what they, where they agree, where they disagree and what they think. And now the, the landscape is pretty, uh, you know, they have it done. People just aren't talking as much in public. Yeah, you're not, yeah. Now, were you, now I was assuming the nationalists would be pro-Putin, but uh, the way you phrase that made me think I might be wrong. And I know that actually Navalny, unben you know, uh, and Westerners may not totally appreciate this, has in the past uh, expressed some pretty nationalist themes. I mean, I think the West, we think of him as this cosmopolitan pro-Western guy. I think in some ways he is, but he has uh, something of a nationalist history. Um Right. So is it is it wrong to think, uh, to conflate Putin and Russian nationalism so casually? So I think, uh, again, it's kind of hard to say because of the, the how, how the landscape has changed in terms of how controlled it is. But I think the turning point was Crimea for the nationalists. Uh, before that, there were a lot of people who were not happy, like nationalists who were not happy with Putin, but getting a chunk of previously Russian territory back into the country was uh, something that a lot of people who were previously in opposition to Putin, they started supporting him because this is finally Russia's, uh, you know, gaining its previous glory and whatnot, and then historical justice. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the times I'm talking about, it was like 2011, 2012, those were the first big, uh, pro-democracy protests. Uh, this was the rise of Navalny. And there was a moment of a broad coalition of people from all uh, parts of the political spectrum where they, it was actually kind of beautiful to watch. There were uh, a few of these events where it was like a conference of all people who agree that Russia needs fair and open elections. Mm -hmm. And then it's through elections that you figure out what the course of the country is going to be. And uh, there were people there who were like people who were maybe not Nazis, but not very far from that and in, in the minority. And there were people who uh, despise the Nazis, the, the, the you know, nationalist uh, people. And you saw them argue and you saw them... Um, you know, disagree and, and, and explain to one another why the other one is wrong, but they were on the same, you know, physically in the same space and they were not mm -hmm. fighting. And there were even some, like, I remember when the streets protests were happening, uh, you could see a little like proto-society emerging. People were taking up the roles within the protest movements and the nationalist guys, they were the, you know, those are the football fans. The, those are the people who can maintain like an orderly line can be on the lookout for the cops. They're, you know, more organized, more militaristic, and they're doing that thing. And then next to them are these, I don't know, feminists who are giving a lecture on uh, sexist language or something. And they were, you know, they, they wouldn't find each other in conversation ordinarily, but there was a, a brief period where they peacefully coexisted and had a common cause, which was fair and open elections. So it didn't last but long. This was when again? That's 2011, 2012. Mm. Uh, speaking of Nazis, is it, uh, do you hear a lot about how a lot of these Ukrainian nationalists, these anti-Russian Ukrainian nationalists are actually Nazis? I, I hear that claim every once in a while. Is that a widespread perception or they're fascists or they're this or they're that? That's the government rhetoric. That's, yeah. th that's the line. How many people agree with that? Uh, some do. I don't know. It's, it's mm -hmm. again, I don't know. There's not like a poll that I can trust to... Uh, gauge the perception of the population at large. So I guess, I don't know, in kind of moving toward uh, toward the end of this, I, I guess for me, one big question was, uh, 
Well, first, first of all, do you think it's uh, possible that the speech last night, as crazy as it sounded to a lot of people, actually was, by and large, smart politics? I mean, I'm thinking of Donald Trump, you know, like uh, he would just, you know, especially at the beginning when I didn't really understand his constituency Mm -hmm. and what he was doing, he would just seem kind of like a crazy ranting person. And then I'd go, oh, this is actually working for him. He actually knows what he's doing. Um, I mean, oh, sure, tons of people think he's crazy, but he knows he, he's, he's, he's hanging on to the base he needs to hang on to to become president. And uh, I guess the first question would be, do you think there's a chance that Putin's speech falls into that category? Uh, and then I have a second question after that. But what does that make sense as a question so so you're talking in terms does it appeal to the people does it is there a constituency that appreciated that speech for for uh, does it appeal to enough people for the speech not to be a sign of actual craziness in other words like maybe even miscalculated a little but still basically what he said last night is going to appeal to enough people for it to have been a a, a kind of a reasonable political you know, gambit. I don't know. I would I would need to wait a little and talk to more people to gauge uh, whether the perception that I've seen so far is pretty universal or not. Uh, I haven't seen anybody who was anything but worried uh, after this. But then again, in the last, you know, like since COVID and uh, Navalny's return, um, I don't know if he cares a whole lot about how appealing he is to the people. Like there is not, who's going to challenge him? Who's, uh, so, so let's say people are worried and upset. Um, how does that bring trouble to his reign? I don't see the mechanism for it. There's not going to be, uh, uh, I don't think there's going to be any kind of successful public protest or anything. Um, I think people are going to stay home and you know, those who liked it are going to say, I liked it. I don't know if there are going to be many of them. Those who are anxious and depressed as a result of that speech, well, they're going to be anxious and depressed, but there's not, I, I don't see a consequence on the home front for him. So yeah. I think the the move is more like geopolitical. It's more what happens next in terms of what he does in Ukraine, what reaction he's going to get from the West, how he's going to react to the reaction. Uh, and that. I don't know. Uh, I um, my guess would be is he doesn't like he's open for many possibilities of how things can go down, and he's gonna play it by ear uh, as the situation progresses. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm I'm worried. I don't know what's gonna happen. And what has he done that? in your view, makes him more impervious to public opinion, makes him, so he's, he's, uh, he's jailed Navalny, tried to, apparently tried to have him killed. Uh, he's, uh, there's some, well, there's another guy who was like shot on a bridge who I gather was a problematic. Uh, uh, that was earlier. Um, that was a so while ago. Since, since Navalny's arrest, it was not just Navalny, it's also people who were like, in some faraway region, they were in Navalny's, uh, you know, part of his organization. Uh, some of those people were either jailed or left before they were jailed. Um, there is this uh, law that's been widely uh, applied now about foreign agents. So this is uh, if you're doing any kind of journalistic or activist, any kind of work in Russia that, you know, they deem socially uh, important, uh, and you have any kind of money coming in from from abroad, uh, you have to label yourself a foreign agent. And then there are rules like every like my Twitter feed has a lot of these. So you, if you are a foreign agent, you need to put this pretty lengthy, like a paragraph long uh, description, like a label. This message has been produced by a foreign agent. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, that puts a strain on any kind of free media because, uh, individuals can be labeled that media, um, 
institutions can be labeled that, and everybody's a foreign agent nowadays. Uh, everybody who's uh, free. Yeah, it's funny. Um, I remember talking to you maybe, uh, I don't know, six, seven years ago or something. And I think the idea was, well, Putin does, the government does exert a strong influence on what you see on like TV and that kind of media. It's not paying that much attention to the internet. The internet doesn't matter so much because it's mainly young people and but, but it sounds to me, but and I remember thinking, well, it can't do that forever. I mean, the, the internet's going to matter more and more. It, it, it seems to me that it is uh, doing more to influence internet discourse than it was yes. maybe. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, you know, those kinds of things. There's also, you know, in America, everybody's concerned about the Russian trolls. We got them first. Like we got the fake people online arguing on the behalf of, of the regime yeah. here first. Um, there is, uh, when I, uh, refresh my Twitter feed on my phone, the images don't load up. And I think that's a consequence of the government intervention as well, because they said they're going to slow Twitter down. You mean just um, recently, like that started, this started recently? Been, uh, I don't know, a year, maybe six months. Hmm. Um, they load up on, on desktop, not on the phone. Uh, but there was like, the, they did say we're going to slow Twitter down. Uh, and, and there's like back and forth about, uh, you know, a push and pull with YouTube and stuff. Cause YouTube deleted RT in Germany. Uh, they're banned now. Oh. And, and then Russia says, well, we're going to ban, not exactly we're going to ban YouTube, but there's going to be a reaction. There RT hasn't quite being, been a reaction. Uh, uh, I think it's Russia, for Russia, today, to, Russia today. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I mean, quickly on the, on the Russian trolls thing, uh, an asterisk, but I remember you saying something, you knew a guy who worked in what was the big, the big Russian troll, the famous right, one right, in right. St. Petersburg. And, and I got the impression from you that it was maybe a less effective and uh, uh, powerful intervention in American politics than some of us might have thought. By his account, they they were just being asked. To yeah, just... the original the original <laughs> right. message I got from him is this was a you know a stupid job. He was just posting burgers and flags and guns on some you know Texan page or something. Um, but I have since heard an update that there is apparently been a change in the managerial staff and now they're more coherent and this is a more interesting kind of job and it's uh I, this is only yeah. this is only hearsay I, I don't don't i haven't had like an in-depth conversation but uh i think the one guy that i've heard from said uh they're like um, have a more coherent approach to spreading conservative uh messages online online in russia or, or both? No, online in America. In America. That's that's yeah. that's still that 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 same front. Because this guy, this was after the election, the the 2016 election, and it sounded yeah. like at that point, his mission was mainly just to rack up numbers, however he could rack them up, uh, without right. without having to show that they had actually done much to hurt Hillary Clinton. But um, well, anyway. So, anything you want to say in closing about uh? the whole situation or what, what Americans might not understand. I think this helps us, what we, what we said already, what you've said already helps us understand it more clearly. I don't know if I understand it very well. Um, I don't, I don't understand what, what are the possible outcomes, like how the situation. So I, I, I get how Putin's unhappy with the world order. He wants some kind of a new world order. I don't exactly see how that can be accomplished. And I don't, I don't understand like what are the good strategies on anybody's part? How do you move in the situation to get it to a better, safer, more peaceful uh, place? Yeah. Um, I don't either. Um, I mean, I think, uh, He's calculating that. I think. I think. I. I suspect. Um, you know, I'm going to have a guy on my show eventually, who, who a political scientist who writes about the what he thinks is the underappreciated role in just status considerations in international politics. It's like nations want respect. 
They, they want, you know, st- their perception of whether you acknowledge their status matters to them. Leaders, individual humans, we know want that. Yeah. I think Putin is somebody who thinks Russia's not getting respect and he's not getting respect. He's the leader of Russia. he really wants it. I yeah. think that's and, one of the- And he really things, wants it. Yeah. And again, the, nothing I'm saying I'm about to say excuses his behavior at all, but I do think American policy has increased the chances that you would wind up with a Russian leader who thinks he's not getting enough respect. And I don't, I don't think it was necessary. No, yeah, I agree with you on the, like, I mean, I would go all the way back to the, you know, the fall of the Soviet Union to the, the uh, Americans talk about the victory in the Cold War. I think that's a problem. Like the Soviet Union that collapsed, that was uh, six years since Perestroika started. This was Soviet Union that was trying to get uh, more open, more democratic. It was more open than Russia is now. If that country falls apart, that shouldn't be seen as a victory. That mm-hmm. that should be seen as, uh, you know, fertile ground for more shit to happen down the road. And uh, I, I think that the entire history since the fall of the Soviet Union has been mismanaged on on the part of the U.S. Um, but I don't know how that can be remedied now. Like, you know, I've heard you uh, where I've read your newsletter where you say, uh, you know, it's a it's it's a pity that um, a, a, a a you know bargaining hasn't been done properly with Putin. I don't know if that's uh, you know, he did say that they've uh, a possibility of a moratorium on Ukraine's membership in NATO was raised, and he was not happy with that because he's saying uh, this is not this is not anything. You're not really giving us anything because you yourself say that Ukraine is not yet ready to join NATO. So if you're saying it's going right. to happen sometime down the road, that's you're just saying we're going to do what we've been meaning to do right. according to our own plans. Um, so, I, but but. You know, to go further than that, what Putin wants is a you know written down guarantee that uh, NATO is gonna, not going to be expanded eastward. Now, I right. don't myself totally understand why NATO had to be expanding all these years eastward, but I also I, I don't think a U-turn on a long-term strategy like that has been happening for decades, and now they're going to change that. Why? Why would that happen? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the politics in the West make it. Difficult. Uh, I I mean, first of all, you're right. I think maybe he was offered a, quote, moratorium, which is a temporary thing uh, by definition. That's what a moratorium is. We we, we were apparently not offering um, to to rule out the possibility of of NATO membership or have NATO issue something ruling it out or anything approaching that. and 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 I think the politics of it are sufficiently difficult that the, that that probably the realistic way that it might have worked. Uh, I mean, the politics in the West are, are are difficult. That would be it would have to be part of a larger deal. I, I think you'd say, okay, uh, you know, um, we're I don't know. There'd be a lot of delicate phrasing, but mm-hmm. I think you you what would be great. If you, uh, I mean, for example, suppose you said to Putin, um, you know, he has his issue, I think, rightly, with what we did in Kosovo in 1999. Right, right. That's, which, which people say this is was a major turning point. Yeah. Well, it, it totally was. I mean, yeah. people say yeah. we're changing borders in Europe by force for the first time since World War II. No, it's not the first time, folks. Right. We did it in Kosovo. And we did it without the UN's authorization, and that really got Russia's attention. We did it in 1999. Yep. So, an example of what a larger deal might be is we say, "Well, look, let's have the people of Crimea vote on who they want to be affiliated with, and let's have the people in Kosovo vote." And probably, and, and and the people in Crimea would vote to be part of Russia. People in Kosovo would, you know, would 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 vote to not be uh, part of Serbia, and you would have settled those in international law. I, 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 I you know, um, I don't want to get to, into this too much, but I, I appreciate how delicate uh, the whole thing is. And, and I certainly understand how the politics in the West made it difficult to just guarantee that, that 
Ukraine wouldn't uh, become a member of NATO at the same time. One reason the politics are difficult is because nobody talks about it. The whole American foreign policy elite, the journalists, the commentators, mm -hmm. the think tankers, not, almost none of them talked as if it was a realistic possibility. And, and that's why Biden didn't have much political space on this front. It's, it's, like, a, it's like a vicious circle. And, and half of the piece I just published in my newsletter, the non-zero newsletter, uh, is about that. It, I mean, half of it is about kind of why didn't Biden offer this? But the other half is that why is it that our foreign policy conversation is so constrained that even though we knew this, you know, this concession might have a chance at forestalling invasion, nobody talked about it in America. There was almost no one advocating it almost no kind of respectable member of the foreign policy establishment advocating it. It's just the conversation is so narrow here. And that's one reason there isn't political space. I mean, it's not like there's a bunch of Americans who are against it. They don't think about this shit. You know, they just take their cues from the people on TV. And if the people on TV aren't talking about it, well, then it's a non-starter. And but that's my own crusade, the, the problem with American foreign policy <laughs> discourse. You've got enough You've got enough troubles. So I guess I'll let you get back to them unless you uh, want to say anything else. If anybody can get me a visa to some Western European country, I would be appreciated. Uh, I would appreciate that. Actually, I could be an important figure there. I've been your employer. Uh, the, the, that, that's, what, that's what you need in these, in these things, apparently. Um, from the oh, U.S. Right. point of view, you need uh, the, uh, there's this type of letter you sign that is absurdly over the top in its praise of the person. I signed one of these once. This guy <laughs> was coming from Canada and his lawyer said, here's what you got to sign. And it's like, <laughs> this guy is so fucking great. If you don't let him into America, I don't see how the Republic survives. I'd be willing to say that about you. Um, the uh, But let me okay, say, we're, we're, yeah, meanwhile, where people can find your work is uh, at your newsletter, Psychopolitica. Uh, and right, psychopolitica.com or psychopolitica.substack. I just published uh, a new issue with weird selection of news from China uh, with some art by other people that I really like. Okay. And uh, your Twitter handle is what? Nikita S. Petrov. P E T R O V. Uh, and that's, wait, does that have dots in it or is it just continuous? No, no, just Nikita S. Petrov, all in one word. Okay. Well, thanks, Nikita. Uh, and Thank let, you. let's talk down the line.